Well, first of all, who are Cyril and Methodius? Obviously, we're not celebrating Valentine's Day if we're commemorating <laughs> two monks, of all things. Brothers, <coughs> extraordinarily well-connected people from what we now know as Thessalonica, or to be, to be correct now, Thessaloniki, which is how it is pronounced, the locals there knew anyway. These were people, Cyril was an extraordinary scholar. He was proficient in a whole host of languages. Uh, in fact, when, and the same for Methodius. Methodius was a ruler, someone who had connections in government, and really came almost late in life to the monastic life. They were commissioned to go and bring the gospel to Slavia. Uh, a group of people who, in fact, other people in Europe thought were worthless and actually not worth the time at all. I mean, in some ways, to commend them is a way of saying that we <coughs> learn uh, all people matter in the sight of God, which is one of the emphases in the Ephesian lesson, where Paul says, in essence, guess what I have come to discover to my utter astonishment? The gospel is for everybody and not just for the Jews. And this is certainly, in essence, played out in the life of Syria and Methodius. The other thing that strikes me as it relates to them and the reading was they really brought the very best of who they were to their enterprise. Um, the Slavs had no written language. And so in an effort to try to translate the gospel, not unlike Wycliffe Bible translators of our day, they had to actually create an alphabet to be able to translate the gospel and hand it out. So they were not just sort of preachers, they also taught literacy and brought to a group of people a written form of their language that they had never had before. In fact, the, uh, this is I'm holding this book, the title of their language, or at least their written text, is called Glogolithic. So if you really wanted to do something interesting, you could write your Valentine in Glogolithic and <laughs> Not that I would know how to do that. Uh, it's a Cyrillic alphabet, which means it has characters. It's not Roman. I, I think for us, the message to them, from them to us, particularly out of the Ephesian lesson, really is those two things. <coughs> Number one, all people matter in the sight of God. There is no somehow one group that is in the gospel and the rest that do not follow. That all people before God deserve a hearing, the hearing of the gospel. And what that means in a very practical way is, as Paul says in the Ephesian lesson, of this gospel, I have been made a servant. <coughs> Meaning my calling, my vocation, my job is to make myself available for God to use me wherever I am, should the door open to, that I might share the gospel not just with my friends, but with the person when I pay at the convenience store, the person who checks out my groceries. All of those people are, in fact, equally important to God. So that while you and I might have cultural preferences, people we like and don't like, friends and people who are not so friendly, people to whom we can easily relate and others with whom we have a hard time relating. Uh, that just, that's what it means to be human. The fact of the matter is, is that our relational um, quotient in relationship to a person does not in any way mean that we might not be called by God to seek an opportunity to share the gospel with them. That's what it means when Paul says, of this gospel, I have been made a servant. In other words, the gospel, which is Christ died and rose again for all people everywhere, and to be a servant of that gospel means, that means my job before God as the gospel servant is to be prepared at all times and in all places with everyone to, as the scripture says, give a reason for the hope that is within me. Now, that's incredibly appropriate to a service of confirmation. And for us as a congregation renewing our baptismal vows, because the content of the baptismal vows, the commitments that we make together that have been deep in baptism, affirmed in confirmation, is in fact that yes, we will be those servants. 
That's really the essence of what it means. Even to say that we respect the dignity of every people, everyone, means all people are, in essence, worth our honoring them with the sharing of the good news, with the pouring out of our lives, with whatever is necessary by the mercy of God to help bring them to Christ. And for me not to put a stumbling block in anyone's way up for the gospel by my behavior. So there isn't a group of people that I should treat nicely and then another group of people that I should just use to get what I want. That does not respect the dignity of every human being, nor does it reflect being a servant of the gospel. It really means in a very radical way that, that is so counter to our own culture and much of our own upbringing that literally every person we meet is someone for whom Christ died. And because of that, worthy of the way we approach, the way we honor them, the way we deal with them, regardless of their station, because all of them, by virtue of what the gospel has done, are worthy of that great and honorable message. So in the renewing of our baptismal vows, what we're saying, sort of in shorthand, is yes, I too will be a servant of the gospel. I will with God's help. Amen. Amen.